Let's close our eyes for prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your children, brothers and sisters, the fathers and the mothers who are here exactly late today. Lord, we're praying you teach us the truth of your word in Jesus' name. And we pray that everywhere we listen to this teaching today, you will touch every heart, transform every life, and help us, Lord, to face the right direction, looking for the coming of the Lord. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. We can sit down. We're studying from 1 John today, and it's 1 John chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we shall be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. It says, Beloved, now, at this time, this present age, now, even today, some people say you cannot know you're a real child of God until you get to the great beyond. Some people say you cannot be sure you are getting to heaven until you eventually reach there. There is some certainty, there is some belief. But John, the beloved, said, even at this time, I pray it will happen to you. It says, Behold, now, beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall see him, and we shall be like him, for we shall see him. And then it tells us in verse 3, if you have that hope in you, if you have that expectation in you, if that is your desire, if that is your dream, if you are the one saying one day, one day, when Christ shall come, and when the saints go marching in, I will be there. I pray that will be your expectation, and that will be your hope. But it says it should not be an empty hope. It, is, it should not be a rotting hope. It should not be an uncertain hope. It says if you have that hope in you, there is something to do. You must prepare. Look at this in verse 3. It says, And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. It's telling us that something must take place in your life. Something must take place in my life. If we, if you and I are going to see him when he appears on that day, and I pray you will see him when he appears in Jesus' name. We're looking at this a study today, and it's the purity of rapturable saints. The purity of rapturable saints. When we talk of rapture, that word rapture is a word that is got from a Latin word. And it means it's being cut off. That is, a time will come when Christ himself will come back. And when we talk of the second coming of the Lord, there are two faces. One face is Christ will appear. He appears in the air and his feet will not touch the earth. But then the dead in Christ shall rise and those of us who are alive will catch us up and will be with him in the air. Now the second phase of the second coming is after the great tribulation. After that great tribulation, Christ will have been with the saints on high. And then he will come at the end of that great tribulation. At that time, he will not be in the air. He will come and then his feet will touch the earth. And then he will set up his millennial reign. The first part, that's the rapture. Look at this in 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, First Corinthians chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 51, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, that means we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. That's talking about the rapture, and it says it's a mystery. It's a hidden thing. Many people do not know about that. And the Old Testament saints did not know about that. And it says, behold, Paul the Apostle says, this one is exciting. This one is a revelation. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Then look at this in verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Tell me the last thing there. 
and we shall be changed. You see, when he said we, he was thinking that the rapture could take place any time. There are some people that deceive themselves. They say the Lord cannot come now. They say the rapture cannot take place now. They say, why do they say that? It's because they say, because this must happen for us, that must happen for us, that must happen for us. But Paul the apostle said the rapture can take place anytime. It says, We shall be changed. I pray you'll be there. Actually, Jesus said in John chapter 14. John chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 1. In John chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. If you are born again, let not your heart be troubled. If grace has come in your life, and then it has changed your life, transformed your life, turned you around, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Thank God I believe in God. I said, I believe in God, and I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my Savior. He is my substitute. He is my sin bearer. He has taken my sins away. That's why Jesus said, if you have received him into your heart, and if he is your Savior, if he has taken your sins away, and you have the witness of the Spirit in your heart that you are a child of God, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, you also believe in me. Then he says in verse 2, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Then he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And then he says, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. You see, he said that, and he, all, everything he said, it was always fulfilled. And here he says, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That's the rapture. It's not talking about coming to judge the world. That's the second coming. It's not talking about setting up a millennial reign here now. That's the second coming. But when he first comes in the first phase, he says, I will receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye shall be also. You'll be there. Where is he now? I say, where is he now? He's in heaven. And he says, where I am, there you will be also. Have you found some people that knock at your door? And when they knock at your door, you say, what do you want? They say, I want to sell a particular paper, magazine, something to you. And they say, tell me what's there before I buy. They say, we well, want to tell you how we will live on this earth forever. And I say, please go your way. Go with your paper. I don't want to live in this dusty area forever, forever, forever. I want to live over there forever. I said I want to live over there forever. He said, so that where I am, that is heaven. He said, that is where you will be. He was talking about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians, I'm reading here from chapter 4, and it tells us in verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, it says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe, thank God I believe. If we believe, thank God I believe. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, shall not proceed, shall not stop, shall not hinder them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Not an angel. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. And it says, with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise forth. Then, what's the next word there? We. You see, Paul, the apostle, knew it could happen any time. He wasn't saying, you know, Jesus cannot come at this time because of this reason and because of that reason. He said, we, 
all those apostles, when he talked about the rapture, when he talked about the coming of the Lord, they were not saying this must still happen before he comes, that will happen before he comes. It can happen anytime. And I pray that every one of us will have the grace and will meet him on that final day. You will be there. I said you will be there. Then he said, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up that's the word rapture there in the original. Shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in Jerusalem. To meet the Lord on Mount Olive. No, to meet the Lord in the air. That's the rapture. That's the rapture. When he comes, that first phase of his coming will meet him in the air. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's why we come to this passage today in First John chapter 3. Reading from, studying from verses 1 and 2 and 3. The purity of rapturable saints. The purity of rapturable saints. The rapture is not for sinners. The rapture is not for backsliders. The rapture is not for religious people. The rapture is not for reprobates. The rapture is not for people who are in their sins and they enjoy their sins. It's the rapture for the saints. That's what we're talking about. The purity of rapturable saints. There are three things we're going to consider. Number one, the undiscernible privilege of real sonship. That is undiscerned. What people don't know. What they do not realize. And they look at us as ordinary people. They look at us as if, you know, we're just like them. Because, uh, you know, we look like them. We have the same complexion of skin like them. And we walk like them. And here we are. And they do not make any difference. Look at this in verse 1. First John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of law? The Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Undiscerned, undiscernible, unknown, unrecognized, and yet were children of God. I'm a child of God. I said, I'm a child of God. And people do not know that. They do not know you have a special privilege. They do not know you have a special promise. They do not know you have a special provision that the Lord has made for you. It says, therefore, the world does not know us. Because the world did not recognize him. Point number one, the undiscernible privilege of real sonship. Point number two. Point number two, the undeniable peculiarity of righteous sons. The undeniable peculiarity of righteous sons. That's in verse two. Look at verse two. It says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. Then he says, but we know, we know, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's a peculiarity that is undeniable. It will be yours in Jesus' name. Point number three, the undefiled purity of rapturable saints. The undefiled purity of rapturable saints. Look at verse 3 here. And every man, that means everyone, brother or sister, boy or girl, youth or adult, it says, and everyone, every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Even as he is pure. What kind of purity is that? Undefiled purity of rapturable sins. We're coming back to number one. The undiscernible privilege of real sonship. Look at verse one again. Behold, what manner of law the Father has bestowed upon us that we shall be called the sons of God. That we shall be called the sons of God. That we, at this present time, and in this present age, even in the life that we're living now, that we shall be called the sons of God. That the almighty God himself shall call us 
his own sons, that Jesus Christ, by the grace has given us, shall refer to us, us of all people, you and I of all people, that heaven should point at you and say, that's the son of God. That's the real son of God. And what a privilege this is, and what an opportunity this is, and what grace this is, and what provision this is, that we should be called the sons of God. Then it says, therefore, therefore, what heaven recognizes, the world does not recognize. What God appreciates, the world does not appreciate. And what the angels are rejoicing about, the world does not rejoice about that. That's why it says, heaven knows us and God calls us his children, that we are called the sons of God. And yet it says, and it says over here, therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Undiscerned, unknown unrecognized, undiscernible, and yet we're sons of God, real sons. How do we become the sons of God? How do we become the sons and the daughters of God? What step did we take? How did we do it? Because it says all have seen and come short of the glory of God. What step did you take? What step did I take? What step does that man there, that woman there, what step do you have to take to become the sons of God? In 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 17. It says, wherefore come out from among them. Among them who? Among them, your native people. Among them who? Among them, your religious people. Among them who? Among them, the sinful community. All have seen and come short of the glory of God. That's where we all were. Because that same spirit of disobedience, spirit of sinning, and spirit of following after the things of the flesh, it worked in everyone as the children of disobedience. And it says, a special privilege is waiting for the sons of God. A special opportunity is waiting for the sons of God. And if you want that opportunity, look at what it says, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. You know, the teaching of separation from the world. The doctrine of separation from the world. You separate from the practices of the world. You separate from the pollutions of the world. And you separate from all the principles of the world. Everything they're doing. It says, this says the Lord. It is the Lord that says this one. You know, some people feel it's deeper life that said that. Deeper life says so because God said so. They say it is the holiness church that says that. The holiness church says that because God says so. They say it is a pastor so and so that said that. Pastor so and so is saying that because God says so. Look at it. It says, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And touch not the unclean thing. What does that mean? Anything that will make you unclean. You're expecting the coming of the Lord. And you want to retain the grace and the godliness that will lead to the glory. When Christ will come, he says, will not touch the unclean thing. Anything that will defile your mind. Anything that will defile your soul. Anything that will defile your thoughts. Anything that will make your life unclean in the sight of the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. And then he says, and, I, and then I will receive you. Look at Verse 18, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be, tell me, and ye shall be, I want to hear you there, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty, is telling us that repentance must come first. We must turn away from sin. We must separate ourselves from the sins in the society. And then we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at him. He died for you on the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood for you. And then he said, as you repent and believe, the Lord will receive you. You'll be a child of God. And then he will give you the grace to continue. You will continue. Because it's only those who continue in my word. Those are my disciples. Indeed, look at Galatians 
chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 4. Galatians chapter 4. We're looking at verse 4. We're looking at the sons of God. The real sons of God. How do we become? You repent. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God will be a witness in your heart. You are a child of God. Galatians chapter 4 verse 4. It says, but when... The fullness of time was come. God sent forth his son, capital S, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them, to save them, to change them, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. We have to go through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. It says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And because he died for us, he's paid the price. Everything that needs to be done has been done. And now you say, I come. I come, Lord Jesus. I want to be a child of God. I turn away from my sin. I turn to the Lord. And whosoever cometh unto me, I will in no wise reject, he will receive you. I said he'll receive you. No matter how far you have gone. No matter what you have done. The moment you make up your mind and you say, I am going to Jesus. I leave sin. I leave Satan. I leave evil spirit. I leave sorcery. I leave darkness. I leave occultism. I leave that gang. I am coming to Jesus. The spirit of God will even help you. He'll move you on. And this very hour, you'll be a child of God. Look at verse 6. And because we are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Crying, Daddy, Father. Because now you have the tenderness in your heart. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your guilt is gone. Your condemnation is gone. Now you are a child of God, not because of what you have done, not because I go to church. It's good to go to church, but you know, that alone is not enough. Because I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He has saved me. We're looking at Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9 is telling us uh, that, you know, some people say, Pastor, I'm a child of God. I said, how do you know? My daddy is a church man. My mommy is a church woman. And because daddy and mommy are church people, therefore, automatically, I am a child of God. Uh, look at this now. In Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 6. Not as though... The word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. You see that? They are not all Israel who are of Israel. Read on. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is... They which are the children of the flesh are not the children of God. They which are of the children of the flesh are not the children of God. What it means is, daddy is a Christian, mommy is a Christian, and daddy and mommy gave back to me automatically, I am a a son of God, it says no. Look at that verse again. It says, they which are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Those who take the promise of Christ, come unto me, all ye that labor, and I will give you rest. And personally, by yourself, you make that decision and you come unto him. You say, Lord, I believe. Take my sins away. Take my guilt away. And then his grace comes to you and a change comes upon your life. It was, that's why Jesus said, you must be born again. You know the meaning of that? He said, now you have been born by daddy and mommy. He said, that birth is the first birth. That one is not enough. If all you can say is that uh, a bishop gave birth to me, he said that's the first birth, but that's not enough. If all you say is that the church gave birth to me, 
I was born in church maternity. He said, that's the first birth. That's not enough. He said, now that you've been born the first time, you must be born now again so that you'll be a real child of God. If it has not happened to you, tonight it will happen. I said, tonight it will happen. Very simple, very simple. Your daddy cannot decide this for you. Your mommy cannot decide this for you. Daddy and mommy decided your first birth. But this second birth, being born again, this is going to be your personal decision. Look at John. John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, here we're reading from verse 3. John chapter 3, verse 3. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again. He was talking to a religious man. He was talking to Nicodemus. He was talking to a man that knew some verses of the Bible. He was talking to a ruler among the religious people. And he said, you've got the first birth. That's why we're here talking together. You've got the first birth. That's why we're here studying the Bible together. You've got the first birth. That's why you're breathing. That's why you're living. But now, if you're going to live in heaven, the second birth is very important. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except, except, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Water baptism is not enough. And of the Spirit, they made the sign of the cross on my forehead. When they baptized me, they confirmed me. He said it's not enough. This one is of the Spirit. That baptism, who did that one? That's the pastor that did that one. He's talking about the Spirit with capital S. That confirmation, who did that? Archbishop or bishop? That's a human being. This one is of the Spirit. Except ye be born of water and of the Spirit. Ye cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. It says, Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. It must happen. And it will happen. And when it happens, the Spirit of God will be a witness in your heart that now you are a child of God. Grace will come into your life. Peace of mind will come to you. You will say, once I was blind, now I can see. Once I was in darkness, now I'm in the light. Once I was a sinner, but now I am forgiven. Now I felt guilty in the past, but now all guilt, all condemnation is gone. And you're on your way to heaven today. You'll have that ticket. The ticket that takes you to heaven, that you'll say, I know it in my heart. I know it in my spirit. I am born again. I am born again. It will happen. Look at Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, here we're reading from verse 14. Romans chapter 8, we're reading here from verse 14. It tells us in verse 14, in Romans chapter 8, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. God. Then it says in verse 15, For ye have not received the Spirit of bondage, Again to fear, that is, once you are born again, you are not fearing eternal judgment anymore. You are not fearing that, you know, God will just take you and throw you to hell anymore. You see, it is the, it is the new birth, it is the forgiveness, it is the salvation that takes that fear away from you. You want to sleep at night, you say, Lord, I praise you. Because you are forgiving my sin. I praise you. Because I am not under condemnation anymore. If the rapture should take place before I wake up tomorrow, I will see my Jesus face to face. You are not thinking, you know, something may happen in the night and then I may not uh, make it. Because the Spirit of God that comes to you, if when other people are going, He will wake you up. And you will go with them in Jesus' name. Look at verse 15. It says, For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And when that grace comes to us and we become children of God, how do we live? 
how do we act? Because when you receive Jesus Christ as your personal savior, your boss in the place of work was not there. And your co-workers were not there. And your neighbors might not have been there. I wasn't there. But when I see you, how will I know that that's a child of God? That's a child of God. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. The people who are the children of God. The people who are the sons and the daughters of God. And the people who are expecting the coming of the Lord. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 2 verse 14. It says, do all things without memories and disputing. That's how I know who are children of God. I can't tell what's in your heart. I didn't know when you open your heart and it says, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens the door, I will come into him and I will sob with him. Maybe you have opened the door of your heart and Christ has come in, but I won't know. How would I know? I would know when you are different from everybody else. Because I know that everybody in the world grumbles, but you don't grumble. I say, that's the Son of God. I know that everybody is uh, complaining. If the sun is shining bright, they complain. If the sun is sh not shining, they complain. If everything is going well, they even complain. If something is not going well, they complain. I know that everybody in the world is murmuring about something. But I see somebody who does not murmur. I see somebody who does not argue. I see somebody who does not fight. I see somebody who goes his life and goes his way. He doesn't quarrel with anybody. Whatever is happening, he does everything he wants to do without murmuring without grumbling, I say this is one of the people, rapturable sons of God, you will soon go to heaven. I said you will soon go to heaven, but if I see you that you are murmuring about everything, complaining about everything, and you are always moody, and you are always sad, and you are always criticizing everybody, criticizing everything, I can't be sure. I don't know whether you are a Christian or not. But look at this in verse 14. It says in that verse 14, it says, do all things. How many things there? Tell me out loud. All things. Everything you do in church. Everything you do at home, everything you do in your office, whatever you do at all. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. But, you know, if you're doing it, but you are, you know, grumbling while doing it, and you are complaining while doing it, and you are murmuring while doing it, you know, that thing does not have the benefit it ought to have. It doesn't have the glory it ought to have. It doesn't have the privilege it ought to have. It doesn't have the reward it ought to have. Look at verse 14. It says, do all things without murmuring. And, and disputing. Look at verse. Uh, look at verse fifteen. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. There we are. It says the reason why you don't murmur, you have the grace. I pray that that grace will be abundant to your life. Somebody there said the grace will be abundant to your life. And then it says, so that in all that, that you will show yourself, you are blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke. Without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, your light will shine. How do I know you are a child of God? When I see people in the darkness of occultism and, you know, you're not there. When I see people in the darkness of evil and you're not there. When I see people, you know, they lower the light, you know, as we're in the light now. We know that this is wonderful. This is good. But, you know, they enter into that, uh, you know, place uh, and then they're doing something there. And you can hear sound, that sound is happening there, but they, they dim the light. When I don't see you there, you love light, you don't love darkness. I know that's a child of God there. Am I talking to somebody? I said that's a child of God there. And you will not hide with them in their darkness anymore in Jesus' name. It says, look at verse 16, holding forth the word of life. When I see somebody, it's not living by the proverbs of, uh, the, of their native land. It's not, uh, you know, it's not saying, according to this proverb, that's why I did what I did. It's not living by the proverb of the tribe. It's living by the word of God. It's holding forth the word of life. 
is holding forth the word of Christ. I know that that's a child of God right there. Should the trumpet be blown anytime, and should Christ come anytime, these ones who have received the grace of God and received the strength to live a godly, righteous life, they will be there in Jesus' name. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that the day of the rapture right there, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Uh, look at, uh, you know, the intention of the Lord when he made you to be born again. He's taking you somewhere. He'll get you there. He's taking you to glory. He'll, t he'll get you there. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm reading here from verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. It says, but we will see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, and crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. That means the death you should have died, Christ has tasted that for you. So that you will not die that miserable death anymore. You will not die as a goat. You will not die as an unbeliever. You will not die like Judas Iscariot. You will not die like a criminal. When you die, it will be the death of the righteous. And then when the trumpet shall sound, I'm looking at somebody there. Heaven is your goal. And heaven is your home. You will get there in Jesus' name. For it became him in verse 10, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing, in bringing, tell me, in bringing many sons unto glory. That's what it's taking us to. When you become a child of God, he's taking you to heaven, he's taking you to paradise, and he says he'll bring many, many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. That's the suffering he went through. He has suffered for you already. And thank God, eternal suffering is taken away from you. Point number one, the undiscernible privilege of real sonship. As we are the sons and the daughters of God, what a great privilege has given us. And I pray you'll be a partaker in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now. is the undeniable peculiarity of righteous sons. The undeniable peculiarity of righteous sons. Let's come to First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 2. First John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, beloved, now are we the sons of God. Brothers and sisters, you must be sure that you are a child of God before you die, before you leave this world, before the day of the rapture. If there is any assurance, it's only here. There is no change of destiny in eternity. There is no alteration of your stage in eternity. Once you leave this place, that's all. There is no repentance in eternity. And there is no restoration in eternity. There is no prayer that will save your soul in eternity. If you are going to be sure you are a child of God, today is the day. You are not sure of tomorrow. You don't know what will happen tomorrow. It is today. And that is why it says, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know. I know something. It says, but we know. Do you know something? I said, do you know? Uh -huh. If you know when there is temptation, you will not give up. If you know, if you know that heaven is your goal, if you know that Christ is coming for you, if you know that when he shall appear, we shall see him as he is, and then we shall be like him. If you set that in front of you all the time, and you know that every time, when there's a little problem, a little misunderstanding, a little, you know, kind of uh, something in the church, stay there, don't stay there, sit down there, don't sit down there, all that will not bother you, because you're looking for something in front and that thing nobody will take it away from you because you have a goal because you have an objective because you have a dream you know where you're going all these little little things will not make you to backslide 
Brother, we didn't, we don't see you in the church anymore. Why didn't you come? Eh, eh, those uh, people don't uh, love me. They don't like me. How do you know? Every time when I come to church, I want to sit there. Some of these people, those people standing, they'll say, rise up from there and go there. And since they don't love me, I don't want to stay there. He doesn't have any goal. Thank God I have a goal. I say, thank God I have a goal. And uh, we don't see, sister, what happened to you? We don't see you in church anymore. Uh, Pastor, you know, I was sick. And when I was sick, you know, we have our fellowship. When they are sick, I go to them. I visit them. I do this. I do that. But you know, Pastor, I was sick. I said, for how many days? It was, uh, you know, it was for one day. The headache, it was like my head will break. And you know, Pastor, all that day, nobody came to me. It is my friend in a place of work that came to me. And since my friend came to me now, I've gone with her to her church. You, you are not serious. You were see for one day and because nobody came to see that's why you are not here again thank god you are here tonight you will not go away again i said you'll not go astray again you see when you have the goal and you know where you are going nothing will take your place you know and noah was building the ark and then he was telling the people, the flood is coming, the flood is coming. It can come any time from now. They said, Uncle Noah, that's how you talk. You are troubling us too much. And eventually, when God saw that they will not enter the ark, he said, Noah, go and take those animals. All the space in the ark, replace all these people with animals. Animal will not take my place. A goat will not take my place. Lion will not take my place. A crocodile will not take my place. There are people that others will take their place. That my place, I will keep my place. That heaven, I'm going there. Somebody there said that heaven, I'm going there. Whatever little problem, whatever little misunderstanding, the devil is trying to shift you away from your, from your place so that another person will take your place. Nobody will take your place. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you in heaven. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you unto myself. Let me remind you of something. Jesus told the disciples, there were 12 of them, and he said, all of you that have followed me until this time, in this generation, when I come, you will sit on, if you know that passage, on how many thrones of Israel? Twelve. Twelve. On the twelve seats, the thrones of Israel, judging the tribe of Israel. Judas had a place. He quit. He left. He went away. He went to hell. Paul has taken his place. Nobody will take my place. I said nobody will take my place. You will not allow trial, temptation, trouble, whatever, to take your place. A little thing may happen. It's a test of your faith. It's a test of your commitment that will continue to the end. And thank God I will continue. I said, thank God I will continue. That's why it says, beloved, we're beloved of God now. Are we the sons of God? It does not yet appear what we shall be. Let me show you somebody. His name is Job. Look at Job. Look at Job chapter 19. We're looking at Job chapter 19. And I'm reading from verse 25. Job chapter 19. We're looking, from, we're looking at verse 25. It says, for I know. Somebody there say, for I know. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. You wonder why that man went through all the suffering? He didn't give up because he knew that my Redeemer liveth, and he knew that Christ was coming, and that he shall stand on the latter day. He said, I'm looking for that day. I'm looking towards that day. Those who know the future, and those who know that the rapture is coming, and those who know that they are getting ready for that day, they will not join them. That's why Job said, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day, upon the earth and though after my skin worms destroy this body yet in my flesh shall I see God 
He said, I will see God. He was having sickness, I shall see God. He was having pain, I shall see God. All his friends were accusing him. He said, you are counselor, you are miserable counselors. But I know, I shall see him. You will not allow anything to take this hope away from you. And by the grace of God, you'll make it on that final day in Jesus' name. Look at this in verse 27. Whom I shall see for myself. That's a goal. Whom I shall see for myself. That's a vision. Whom I shall see for myself. That was his, uh, his passion and his desire. That's why he didn't give up. That's why you'll not give up. You know, in this world, there'll be times of rain. There'll be times of sunshine. There'll be times of adversity. There'll be times of prosperity. There'll be times of down. There'll be times of up. There'll be times when there are many friends. There'll be times when maybe there's no friend. There'll be times when you are tired. There'll be times when you are strong. There'll be times when people push you. There'll be times when people help you. Whatever the time, you will see the Lord. And then you make up your mind, whatever may be happening, your friends forsake you. I've not seen brother so and so for a long time in this my condition. If it were himself, I would have visited him. I've not seen sister so and so after this time. And look at what I'm going through. If it was them, I know what I will do. I know I will run after them and visit them and encourage them. Don't worry. Look at this verse 27. It says, whom I shall see for myself and mine eyes shall be hold him and not another though my race be consumed within me it is that hope that keeps us on because you know i'm going to see him i said i am going to see him uh, look at uh, psalm 17 psalm 17 we're looking at verse 15 you will not give up i said you will not give up because the lord is expecting you in heaven and thank god you will get there and if you're going to get there, you'll not stop your journey halfway. You have started. You're going to continue. We're looking at Psalm 17. Psalm 17. I'm reading from verse 15. As for me, I will behold his face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with his like with thy likeness. That is, I'll be like him. I'll be like my redeemer. I'll be like my savior. You, you know, Jesus, guys, look up here for a moment. Before he died, he could only be in one place at the same time. Before he died, a few times he walked on the water. And then Peter also walked on the water, going after him. But you know, there were times he'll sit by the well. There were times he'll be tired. There'll be times he'll say, children, what are you doing there? But then he rose from the dead. And they closed the door. And they shut the door. And as they were, and as they were inside that shut door, he had a kind of body that he just appeared before them and said, children, peace be unto you. And then, because the doors could not keep him away anymore, the walls could not keep him away anymore, and then uh, one of the women, the believers wanted to touch, he said, don't touch me yet, I go to my father, and then I'll come to you. All of a sudden, he was in heaven. Look at how far heaven is. He was just there. And then that same evening, he came back to his own disciples, and then you will have the same body as Jesus Christ. When he comes, and you see him as it is, as he is, is the glorified body. It's the risen body that nothing will hinder you even to think of that. Like, you know, if you want to go to now, you want to go to Bagada, you have to, you know, get a bus over there or your car and drive and drive and then go through all that. But that time, when you, as you are here and you want to go to just Jerusalem, you are in Jerusalem. Anywhere you are, you are just there. Just the thought, it will be a wonderful thing. It will be faster than aeroplane. It will be faster than Concord. It will be faster than a jet. Because just like Jesus Christ, you will be like him. I'm waiting for that day. I said I'm waiting for that day. And it is for those who are born again. It is for those who are sons of God. And those who are the children of God, you will not miss it in Jesus' name. Look at your body. All the scars in your body, everything will be taken away. When we look at, at you like this, you'll be as beautiful as the angels of God. And then as we will see the glory of God upon you at that time, because you will see him and you will be like him. No scar. No deformity. Nothing like that. If you are not walking straight now, you'll walk perfectly. 
Everything will be all right. I see I'm waiting for that day. Somebody there, I'm waiting for that day. It will happen in Jesus' name. L look at this, look at this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 9. What will happen that day? How good, how great, how glorious this will be. What it, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, For as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. I love the Lord. I said I love the Lord. And it has not appeared to any man what will be the glory that will be upon you on that day. I pray I will see you. I said I will see you. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 18. In verse 18 it says, but we all, but we all, we're born again, but we all, we're children of God, but we all, we all have this hope in us. We're cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. We're washed and we're purified in the blood of the Lamb. But we all, with open face beholding, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image. That is how Christ is now. The glory he wears now and the splendor that he possesses now will be changed to the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I pray you will not miss that day in Jesus' name. Uh, look, at, uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm reading here from verse 1. It says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He's talking about our body. He says the body we're having now it's like we're wearing clothes, we're wearing a cloak which is earthly. It will be dissolved and then we have one which is in heaven. Then it says, for in this, for in this we groan. Because earnestly desiring to be closed upon with our house which is from heaven. A new body which is from heaven. Then it goes on to say in verse 6, therefore, we always, we're always confident knowing this whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. That is, we are here now at home in the body and we are not directly now face to face with God. Yes, we have salvation. Yes, we have sanctification. Yes, we have holiness. And yes, we have the presence of God with us. But we are not in heaven yet. That's why it says we are, we are not present with him. Then it says in verse 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Now verse 8, this is the glory we are confident I say. I'm willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. To be present with the Lord. You'll be there. Or are you there? You will be there in Jesus' name. Number one is the undiscernible privilege of real sonship. Number two is the undeniable peculiarity of righteous sons. Point number three now, the undefiled purity. The undefiled purity of rapturable sins. Undefiled purity of rapturable sins. We're coming to First John chapter three, verse three. First John chapter three, and we're reading from verse three. First John chapter three, we're reading from verse three. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. It's telling us that this is not an idle hope. He's saying that this is not an ignorant hope. He's telling us that this is not a shallow hope. He's saying that this is not a sensual hope. He's saying it's a kind of hope that does something in us that makes us to go to Calvary, that makes us to have the blood of Jesus applied in our heart, applied on our conscience, applied on our personality so that 
that blood will keep us pure. He'll keep you pure. It's not, it's, it's not saying that you try by yourself and do everything you can do and struggle so that you will qualify yourself for heaven. Nobody can qualify himself for heaven, but God can qualify you for heaven. Christ can qualify you for heaven. The grace of God will qualify you for heaven. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. I said, his grace is sufficient for you. And no matter where you live, and no matter all the things that surround you, the blood of Jesus will make you whiter than snow in Jesus' name. You know, this is undefiled purity. That is, the purity grants us that will help us to make it. Because if we're defiled in any way, defilement will not allow us to get there. Look at Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 27. It says in verse 27, and I shall in no wise enter into it any sin that defileth. You see that? That's why you run to the cross immediately. That's why you run to Christ immediately. And you'll not say, I want to enjoy that defilement a little bit more. Ah, that's dangerous. That's why you'll not say, I want to wait a little bit and see, uh, you know, whether it will increase or whatever. It says, if there's any defilement, you run to Christ immediately. And you say, Lord, cleanse me. Lord, purge me. And Lord, purify me. He'll do it for you in Jesus' name. It says, there shall be no wine Sanctify into it any sin that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. He expects that the blood of Jesus will wash us and it will cleanse us, and all defilement is taken away. And because that defilement is taken away, when Christ shall come and when the trumpet shall sound, thank God I will be there. I said, thank God, I'll be there. You're not allowing any secret defilement in your life, any secret defilement in your personality, in your soul, in your heart. In Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 4. Revelation chapter 14, verse 4. It says, these are they which are not defiled with women. These are they which are not defiled with women. Those are the people getting ready. And those are the people Christ is coming for. These are the people, every man that has this hope in him, purifies himself, even as Christ is pure. We're not defiled by concubines. There are some people, they have uh, one wife. They say, I'm a man of one wife. Uh-huh, I hear you. How about the concubines outside? You're not defiled by concubines because you see the blood of Jesus us, cleanses us, and purifies us. It says in that verse 4, these are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. And then it goes on to say, and these are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. That is, they follow the example of Jesus Christ. They follow him in purity. They follow the example of Jesus Christ. They follow him in righteousness. Every day, every moment of their lives, they say, I know my Redeemer. I know my Shepherd. I know whom I'm following. And when temptations come, he says, no, I cannot do that. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. And I say the same thing. Get thee behind me, Satan. He'll get behind you. He will not allow, God will not allow you to fall. You'll be more than a conqueror in Jesus' name. These are the redeemed from among men. He says, being the first fruit unto God and to the Lamb. Look at verse 5. Verse 5, it says, and in their mouth found, was found no girl. For they are without fault before the throne of God. They are purged, they are purified, they are cleansed. And because of that, things are totally changed in them. Hey, look at Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. And I'm reading here from verse 20. Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. We're reading from verse 20. And see the things that by the grace of God, the blood of Jesus will wash away from your life. Because you need to be pure. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as Christ is pure, even as he is pure. In Mark chapter 7, verse 20, verse 20 says, And he said, That which cometh out of man, that defileth the man, 
And you say, hey, this is why the Lord is saying that if we're going to be ready for the coming of the Lord, if we're going to be ready for the rapture, which can happen at any time, it says, all this will not be your life. Look at verse 21. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, they defile the man, adulteries, they defile the man, fornications, they defile the man, murders, they defile the man, thefts, stealing, that defiles the man, covetousness, that defiles the man, and wickedness, that defiles the man, deceit, lying, hypocrisy, that defiles the man, lasciviousness, and an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and then he talks about foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. And if all these things are there, one or two of them, they are there. And you are not seeing that thing like you know, say baby. And you are not seeing evil thought like you know, say baby. And you are not seeing an adulterous thought like you know, say baby. And you are not seeing a pornography like you know, say baby. It's like, you know, this is my baby. This is my baby. All these evil thoughts, the girlfriend, the boyfriend, and you are not seeing defilement. And Christ comes. There will be no chance for you to repent. And then you'll go through the great tribulation, I will not be here. You know, at that time you are looking for pastor. The pastor will counsel me, Pastor, what do I do now? Because uh, the rapture has taken place and because I was not seeing the baby, I was not seeing uh, fornication, I was not seeing adultery. Because of that, you know, I didn't go. I'm looking for pastor. I will go to, you know, the headquarters. Will I be there? I said, will I be there? Uh -uh. I will not be there. I would have gone. Because when the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ, when they rise and the saints of God go marching in, I'll be number one there. I said, I'll be number one there. I would have gone. If you're looking for counseling, then you will not find me here. Any pastor you find here, then that will say, I will counsel you. That pastor has missed the rapture. How can somebody who has missed the rapture make you qualified again? That pastor is lost and you are lost. I will not be lost. If there's going to be any cleansing, if there's going to be any purity, it is today. And thank God the blood of Jesus Christ is still there today. And whatever impurity and whatever defilement may be there you come to the blood of the Lamb it will cleanse you in Jesus name and it will wash you whiter than snow I said it will wash you whiter than snow the Lord is available today and that blood is still flowing today look at Psalm 51 we're looking at Psalm 51 and see what the Lord said he will do he will purify you he will purge you he will cleanse you he'll make you as white as snow he'll make you even whiter than snow I'm reading here from uh, uh, Psalm 51 Psalm 51 and I'm reading from verse 7. It says, Porch me with Esau and I shall be clean. Tonight you'll be clean. And then it says, Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. It can happen tonight. It will happen tonight. It must happen tonight. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. I'm reading here from verse 18. Isaiah Chapter 1, and I'm reading here from verse 18. It says, come now. When should we come to Christ? Come now. When should we come for cleansing? Come now. When should we come for salvation? Come now. When should we come for this purifying and this purging and this cleansing by the blood of the Lamb? When should we come? Now, tomorrow may be too late. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Do your sins be as scarlet? They shall be as white as snow. The mercy of God is still available today. The cleansing of the lamp is still available today. They shall be white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, then it says they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, if ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. What does that mean? Jesus said, I've eaten this with you. I've drunk this with you. But now, next time, I will eat it with you in the kingdom when I get to the kingdom. Well, we'll it will sup with us. It will fellowship with us. We'll take part in the marriage supper of the Lamb. He said, if you come now and it cleanses you and it purges you and every day of your life, you're always looking at that goal. I'm going to make it. I'll not allow anything to come and stay that will defeat 
defile me. I want to take part in that glorious supper of the Lamb. Then he says, if you be willing and you're obedient, you will eat the good of the land. I will be there. Somebody there, I will be there. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, I will be there. The possibility is there today. The opportunity is there today. He will cleanse you. He will purge you. He doesn't reject anyone. And every man that has this hope in him, purifies himself, even as he is pure. This is your chance, my brother. This is your chance, my sister. Whatever you have done, the blood of Jesus is available. Just be willing, just be willing, just be willing. If you are willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. If his salvation gets saved, gets saved, it's waiting for you to forgive you. It's waiting for you to save you. It's waiting for you to restore you. It's waiting for you to purify and sanctify you. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord. <laughs>